Good morning, everybody. Via Zoom video conference, I'm happy to have on Derek Kilmer, U.S. Congressman who is representing Washington 6th District and will continue now for the next two years. Good to see you, Derek. It's the first time since the election. Good to see you, too. Great to be back with you. And we have got a lot of things before the end of the year is upon us uh, to help out folks in the 6th and all across the state and the country. Let's talk about, of course, the COVID issue uh, continuing to be a, a big struggle as uh, winter is upon us. And uh, there had been a lot of great efforts in the state of Washington uh, through, and we are seeing now the rest of the country is having major spikes and, and things like that. First, do you think the early work by Governor Inslee helped to keep us on the path that we've been on? Not saying that we're out of the woods or anything like that, but compared to other states? I think, you know, certainly uh, in relation to other states, Washington's doing better than many. Um, but I think what we've seen through the course of this is this is an issue that requires a, a frustrating amount of persistence that, you know, doing things like wearing our masks and maintaining social distance and washing our hands and doing those things that public health experts say um, are important really matters because it, it is, uh, uh, really quite frightening to see just the exponential growth in cases that happens kind of out of the blue where, you know, it can seem like things are pretty rosy and then all of a sudden things pick up. You know, you mentioned that this is a focus in our nation's capital too, and it's certainly a focus for me, both in terms of having Congress take action to crush this virus so that we have things like the testing and the contact tracing and the vaccine distribution that's necessary to crush this virus once and for all, but also to deal with the economic outfall of this, which uh, as, as, as we've discussed, and I'm sure you wanna discuss some more, has just been really painful. I mean, it was March when you guys have passed the HEROES Act that keeps continually being brought up as just, I guess, a overall statement for inactivity across the, across the lines, I guess. But where are we at with any sort of new deals? I heard that in the Senate side, Senator Manchin, West Virginia had been put, putting together some things. Speaker Pelosi uh, looks likely to be close to um, less than what she wanted initially, but still enough to maybe help a little bit. Yeah. Um, I'm really hopeful that we see a COVID relief agreement, hopefully this week. Uh, it may bleed into next week. But uh, listen, it's, it's far too late. People have waiting, been waiting far too long. Uh, I made a decision probably about six months ago that when someone reached out to my office having lost their job or having lost their business as a consequence of this pandemic, that I wasn't going to send them a form letter. I was going to call them directly. I was in my office for three hours yesterday calling constituents who've really had the rug pulled out from under them. And people are really hurting. You know, I talked to a woman up in Port Angeles who said, you know, I, she said, I've worked my entire life. And she said, up until March and I lost my job. And she said, I just can't find a job. And she said, I used to organize the food drive for my employer. And she said, for the first time in my life, I had to go to the food bank just to feed my family. Um, I, I talked to small business owners every day who are just hanging on for dear life. And, you know, it's why you mentioned the HEROES Act. Congress, the, on the House side, we passed that. Uh, in May, we passed a, a, a revised version, an updated version that was really intended to be a compromise in October. You know, we haven't yet seen anything pass out of the Senate, let alone any, anything adequate. But I, I think this is the time, you know, it's past the time where Democrats and Republicans need to just come together, secure relief for the American people because they need the help. Is there still some possible of the wranglings with the aftermath of the presidential election and it's not uh, still, uh, you know, no concession yet from the president, but he's he and he's still there until the 20th. Uh, is there some pause perhaps from your colleagues on the other side of the aisle when it comes to making these deals out of the fear of anything? I, I'm just unsure how this is not moving faster now that the election's behind us. Yeah, and apologies for the buzzer in the background. That that's the House floor calling votes, but um, I've got I've got some time. So good, good. Um, you know, for the life of me, I I, I it's hard to explain the inexplicable. I I do not understand how the Senate uh, and specifically uh, Leader McConnell uh, has viewed this through the lens that he has. You know, he back 
um, after the House passed the HEROES Act, said, well, let's just pause on any further action from the federal government. Unfortunately, what didn't pause is the virus. You know, we've continued to see an increase in cases. We've continued to see economic damage done by it. And so while the Senate and Mitch McConnell were pausing, people are really hurting. And uh, I don't think that the status of the presidential, um, the outcome of the presidential election is leading to any delays. And in fact, it should provide an impetus for the outgoing administration to want to have their fingerprints on a COVID relief deal and for Senate Republicans to want to empower this president on his way out to have had some say in what, what the contours of that agreement are. And on the Democratic side, one, we've been saying for several months that people need help and that, that, uh, that we need to make sure we're meeting the needs of Americans who are hurting. And, you know, obviously there's some desire to clear the decks a bit for an incoming Biden administration. This is not the end of federal relief. Unfortunately, I think this pandemic uh, will have lasting impacts. And as you and I've discussed before, so much of the federal relief so far has just been trying to stop the bleeding. At some point, there's going to need to be a focus on trying to get our economy up off the ground and do something that's truly sort of a stimulus to our economy. Um, my hope is that looks at things like infrastructure, which have generally had support from Democrats and Republicans, whether you know whether we're talking about roads and bridges or um, important to our neck of the woods, uh, access to broadband, affordable housing. Uh, these are all things that I think you could see some bipartisan agreement on in the new year. There are still other governmental things that have to be going on throughout the year here, not just the uh, pandemic response. The uh, National Defense Authorization Act is in need of passage. We've got to keep the government funding as well. Uh, let's yeah. start with the defense bill. I know with the 6th, you got uh, uh, the base, uh, naval base up there, and it's a big part of your district. Absolutely. And I, I just fundamentally believe if you serve this country, your government ought to have your back. And that means investing in our service members and in their families. And that's really what the National Defense Authorization Act is about. Um, and uh, I, I think now 59 straight years, Congress has passed a defense bill before the end of the year. We are hopeful that that, that will happen. Um, it's expected that we will vote on a compromise agreement, a bipartisan agreement between the House and the Senate that was announced over the weekend. It's expected that we'll vote on that tomorrow. And um, I, I have to tell you, it includes a whole lot of things that are really important to our neck of the woods um, and things that I fought for to support our troops, to support their families, including a 3% increase in pay for service members. Uh, it includes funding to clean up drinking water on military bases that have, have have been contaminated by PFAS chemicals. Um, it improves some, uh, it includes some improvements in the oversight and, uh, and management of housing for military personnel, which you and I've discussed before is really, is really important. Uh, it makes some key investments in military infrastructure and, and support for, uh, for training and sustainment activities. Um, you know, all of these things are very important. I'll also mention, you know, because I, I know some of your viewers and listeners work at the shipyard, you know, I, I actually introduced a bill last month to ensure that our federal civilian employees, like those that work at the shipyard, who've been working through this pandemic, who've been trying to respond to our national security threats, don't lose their annual leave. You know, their annual leave is use it or lose it. And that's not really fair in the midst of a pandemic. It's not mm -hmm. like people can go travel. And on top of that, you know, we've seen, particularly for shipyard workers, for the folks at Naval Base Kitsap, you know, they've really been call called upon to continue doing their jobs under really extraordinary circumstances. So I introduced a bill along those lines. I'm really happy to report that, um, that, the, the, that the bipartisan agreement actually includes the ability for federal workers to carry over 25% of their annual leave into 2021. So it's not use it or lose it that they're able to carry some of that over. I, I think that's a pretty simple and common sense fix that I think will help a whole lot of, of working families. There's some other stuff that's important to our district. Um, you know, if you go up the coast, uh, the Coho Ferry in Port Angeles, you know, there's a lot of concern within the community about just the strain that this pandemic has had on, the, on that 
I'm a sponsor of a bill to provide some emergency relief to the maritime sector. That was included in the defense bill as well. Uh, we have a ton of veterans in our neck of the woods that have been negatively impacted by exposure to Agent Orange. Uh, this bipartisan agreement provides additional um, protections to cover them to make sure that they're able to get the health care uh, and the benefits that they've earned through their, their service to our country. So uh, I, I'm, I'm pleased that there's a bipartisan agreement. Uh, it looks like we will be voting on that on, on Tuesday. And uh, hopefully this is a bill that'll pass the Senate and get signed by the president. Are these the kind of bills that folks uh, nowadays can keep away any of the add-ins that are not defense specific? Uh, any, well, this any is ironically, that's one of the issues that may be a complication here because the president has actually said that he wants included in the bill something that has nothing to do with the Defense Department that has to do with um, his desire to regulate internet uh, companies like like Facebook and Twitter. Um, not really relevant to the defense bill. Um, and I'd be really concerned to see a bill that's really important to the brave men and women who serve our country. I'd really hate to see it get vetoed for something that's not related to the defense bill. Um, and it's not just me that thinks that. The Republican chairman of the Armed Services Committee said he doesn't think it makes sense to tie unrelated language to the defense bill. Is that the same two that you're thinking about just kind of keeping the government funded? I think you guys have to pass a bill here, what, next week or so to keep things moving? Yeah, the, the you know, historically, uh, Congress is supposed to pass spending bills before the end of September. Unfortunately, in recent years, that hasn't really happened. And so Congress punts. Uh, in this instance, it's punted till December the 11th. And, you know, I will say the House, and I'm on the Appropriations Committee, the House passed almost all of the government funding bills before the summer. Uh, unfortunately, and I don't want to sound like a broken record here, the Senate didn't really get cooking until this fall. It didn't pass any of their bills. It still hasn't passed any of their bills. In fact, it didn't introduce any bills until last month. That's a problem. And, uh, you know, so now we're in a position where Congress sort of has a limited window to come up with a funding agreement that can pass the House, pass the Senate, and be signed by the President. I hope that will get done. Uh, you know, as a member of the Appropriations Committee, we saw in the House bills some um, really vital funding for priorities for our neck of the woods. Uh, you know, I mentioned a pay raise for our military and for our civilian federal workers, funding for Puget Sound recovery, for Puget Sound cleanup, uh, support for Indian country, support for our veterans, uh, a, a, a thankful and important increase in funding for broadband and for rural economic development, which you and I have talked about as a big priority for me. And so, you know, we have divided government. That means, you know, everybody has to give something up. And I, I, I you know, I'm happy to fight for our priorities, um, but I'm also willing to see us strike a fair compromise to avert a government shutdown, which would be really stupid. Um, we have seen how damaging government shutdowns will can be. It looks like Congress may not hit the um, uh, an agreement before that deadline on December 11th. So it may get a week long extension. But I think this is you know, where the American people are rightfully exhausted with dysfunction in Congress. Uh, I've been a big uh, advocate of, a supporter of a lot of reforms to the budget and appropriations process. You and I have just discussed before, I chair a committee that's been nicknamed the Fixed Congress Committee. And we actually proposed eight different uh, reforms for uh, to the budget and appropriations process so we can avoid this kind of, it feels like we're playing the same record year after year after year where Congress is on the verge of a government shutdown. It's, you know, consistently kicking the can. Uh, there has to be a better way and I'm sure pushing for that because our, our, our region doesn't want more chaos. It doesn't want more shutdowns and it wants to see some of these investments that's helpful to rural economic development and helpful to our economy. U.S. Congressman Derek Kilmer representing the 6th District of the great state of Washington, about to head to the floor to take some votes for the people. And so we'll let you go and do that now. It was good to see you. Uh, be well. And uh, we'll check in either down the road or into the new year. Terrific. Take care, everybody. Happy holidays. And I uh, uh, hope to see you in 2021.